Hi, Alanda. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. We're just right. waiting for uh, additional folks to hop on to uh, the Zoom. Um, and then uh, just in a, a couple of minutes, we'll, we'll get started. Great. And I think we're also waiting for Tom as well, so. Yeah, let me ping him real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. For those of, uh, of you who are coming onto the chat, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, a virtual conversation with YUSA um, on the global legacy of the Y. So we're just waiting for additional folks to hop on to the Zoom, and we'll get started in just a second. Hi, Yolanda. How are you? Hi, Tom. How are you? Yeah, I'm great. Thank you. Fantastic. How is uh, Denver today? Denver is quite uh, hot, I think. <laughs> yes, Denver is quite hot. So we're we're just waiting for additional folks to hop onto the chat, and then uh, we'll get we'll get started in just a few seconds. Great. Ready. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, so, so let's just get started. Um, first and foremost, uh, I just want to thank each of you for hopping onto this call, um, a virtual conversation with YUSA about the global legacy of the YMCA and how the Denver Y uh, has been part of that global legacy. Um, I just want to mention that this event is happening um, as part of our welcoming week. Uh, welcoming week at the Denver Y, as well as YMCA's across the country, um, is really an attempt at creating a space where we celebrate the diversity of cultures within our YMCA's, uh, highlight the experiences of those who identify as immigrants, uh, as refugees, asylees, and create a space where we can really have honest conversations about how we're all connected, right? Um, as people uh, in spite of our culture uh, background and differences. And so today uh, we have two, I, I would say mega stars at YUSA in terms of the global work that the Y is doing. Uh, and I just wanna kick us off with um, some introductions um, and, and just read off their bios. If I, if I gave them that opportunity, they'd truncate it, they'd say a few things, you know, but I really want you guys to know of the amazing work that both Tom and Trang have been up to at the y, at YUSA and how they've been in a part of this work pretty much their entire careers. Um, and so we're just gonna start off with, with Tom here. Um, so Tom Valentine is vice president of the international group of y, YMCA of the USA. Tom leads YUSA efforts to strengthen collaboration between the U.S. and the global YMCA movements with a presence in 120 countries. This includes efforts to strengthen U.S. YMCA global partnerships, the coordination of financial and technical support for international YMCA partners, the organization of global youth-led solution summits, and the mobilization of philanthropic support for global YMCA youth and community initiatives, 
aimed at advancing progress toward the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Tom joined the international group of y YMCA of the USA in 1996. Tom has over 30 years of international development experience in Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East. He has extensive experience leading and or managing collaboration with a wide range of YMCA partners, including the United Nations, United States Agency for International Development, AmeriCorps VISTA, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, uh, the Kresge Foundation, the Knight Foundation, Margaret Cargill Philanthropies, Delta Airlines, Viaca, I could go on and on and on. <laughs> Tom has been uh, amazing, amazing uh, in his partnership uh, abilities for the y, for YUSA um, and really began uh, prior to coming to the y, YMCA, uh, began a lot of his journey working for the Catholic Relief Services in Ethiopia, Egypt, Kenya, Uganda, and Burundi. Tom holds a master's degree in international development from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and a bachelor's degree in American Studies at Georgetown University. Tom also speaks French, Spanish, uh, Amharic, a Arabic, and Swahili. And so we're gonna uh, now introduce uh, Trang Trong Hill. Um, and I just wanna say Trang has been uh, such a support of the Denver Y in really standing up uh, our work around uh, equity and diversity, but more specifically, um, our international engagement. So Trang, uh, has worked in the nonprofit sector for over 17 years. Her nonprofit career started with the YMCA of Greater Long Beach in California, where she worked with the immigrant youth and families in after-school programming. In 2013, following eight years with the YMCA of Long Beach, uh, Trang joined the YMCA of USA as the Director of Newcomer Engagement and Global Services. Trang leads, the, leads and coordinates efforts to strengthen the capacity of local wise to work with newcomer immigrant communities and successfully impact diverse communities. She provides national strategic oversight of the growing network of YMCA New American Welcome Centers, the YMCA's participation in National Welcoming Week and external partnerships. Trang also serves as a national steering committee member for the YMCA's Asian and Pacific Islander Employee Resource Group. Trang has a passion for youth development and supporting Asian American Pacific Islander leaders and communities. During her free time, uh, Trang is a community organizer and is part of the co-founding team of Celebrate Argyle, a community initiative that aims to shine a spotlight on immigrant owned restaurants, businesses, and the rich diversity of Chicago's AAPI communities on Asia on uh, Argyle. So, uh, some, some fantastic bios here of these two powerhouses at YUSA. Uh, we're all uh, in for a fantastic treat. And so um, we're gonna hear from, from Tom and, and Trang uh, really about the global uh, movement of the YMCA. Many folks don't know uh, because we're such a locally focused uh, organization oftentimes that we have a global reach. And so we're gonna hear from them about what that reach actually is and how the Denver Y has been connected. And then we're gonna take a step back and I'm gonna ask uh, Trang and, and Tom a few uh, questions I think that, that we all are, are wondering <laughs> as, as local leaders. Um, and, and, and then we're gonna open up for Q&A. So if there are questions that are coming up for you as, as Tom and, and Trang are speaking, feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of, of your Zoom uh, to type in those questions, we'll be monitoring them uh, and then asking uh, our, our guest speakers to, to respond toward the end of the call. So with that, uh, I want to pass it over to, to Tom and Trang to, to lead our conversation moving forward. Um, thank you very much, Yolanda. We're really grateful for the opportunity to, to speak with everybody today. Um, you know, and we also just want to begin by saying uh, how much we love the Denver YMCA. It's a YMCA with a really rich global history and connection to many of our um, incredible global events in the past. Um, and it's also a, a wonderful, increasingly global city. And so we're really 
I'm grateful for the wonderful work that you lead on a day-to-day -day basis to advance equity and social inclusion in your own city, in your own region, um, and also grateful for what you do to support us with our global YMT efforts. And so um, Chang and I are going to kind of tag team today. I'm going to start by giving um, a little bit of an overview of our global YMCA movement and our and our history and, and, and weave in a little bit how Denver has been linked to that. Um, and then we're going to go to a much deeper dive around um, Welcoming Week and our what we're doing to support newcomers and immigrants in the United States, which you're also very much a part of that, that Trang will lead. So Trang, if you would be so kind, can you bring up the presentation? There, there we go. And, um, and we'll get started. So, um, you know, this is a map of the global YMCA movement. Uh, we have a presence, uh, including the United States, in 120 countries around the world. And collectively, we reach over 50 million youth and families around the world um, every year. So we have an enormous impact and legacy um, that stems um, over 179 years. It's incredible. Um, each YMCA around the world is led by um, indigenous local leadership. And so, um, you know, whether it's in Liberia or Colombia or Vietnam, those YMCA's are run by the leaders of their country. Um, and we as the U.S. are just one of 120 of those national movements. So we're a global federation connected together. Um, what's really exciting is that um, even though we are very diverse in terms of the community needs we serve, in terms of the socio-political context that we operate in, um, the size of our YMCA's or the age of our YMCA's, the one thing that really unites our movement is a common commitment to empower young people to lead change. And that's really the one cross-cutting theme across all YMCA's around the world. And in Aarhus, Denmark, in July of 2022, uh, we held the World Council of YMCA's, which gathers all of the YMCA's from around the world to elect our new uh, lay leadership, but also to determine our strategic directions for the future. And for the first time, we um, adopted a long-term strategic vision called Vision 2030 um, to really better articulate the impact that we make as a global YMCA movement on youth and youth leadership and, and what we do to contribute to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to eradicate poverty. And in Vision 2030, we identified four key pillars and themes um, where we want to concentrate and expand our efforts um, over the next eight years. Um, those are um, the development of a sustainable planet, meaningful work for young people, community health and, and well-being, including mental health for young people, and a just world, which is everything that we want to do um, in anti-racism, uh, newcomer and immigrant inclusion, LGBTQ inclusion, and social inclusion more broadly. So um, these are the four cornerstones of the work that we're doing uh, globally. And it's exciting right now because um, while we've always done great work uh, to address inequity in the YMCA movement. Um, we've never had a larger overarching strategy that guides us all in the same direction. And we in the U.S. movement are very deeply involved in a lot of that work. Um, one way that we support the global YMCA movement is through our annual World Service Campaign. And your YMCA and many YMCAs around the country, many individuals and retirees and other partners, contribute to the World Service Campaign to strengthen the leadership, the programs, and the sustainability strategies of our global YMCA movement. And that raises over $3 million a year. Uh, it makes a huge impact. In addition to that, we have more than 200 Y to Y partnerships and coalitions where local YMCAs are part of a deeper partnership uh, with YMCA's around the world, again, for mutual learning to better address equity and social justice issues in our country and around the world. And so there are many vibrant partnerships and coalitions that exist. Trang, you know, is the leader of the Philippines coalition with many local YMCA's throughout the country. And in history, uh, Denver has been a big part of the Nicaragua coalition and also connected to the Border Initiative Coalition, which is many of the YMCA's in the United States working with the YMCA of Mexico along the border to help migrant youth. 
And so Denver has a rich history of being engaged in both World Service and these partnerships. Um, interestingly, in 2014, the United States movement hosted the World Council of YMCAs. Uh, it was hosted at YMCA of the Rockies in Estes Park, uh, just a few hours away from you. And the Denver YMCA played an enormous role in helping to host people um, before, during, and after the conference. And it was really instrumental in helping us have what is remembered today as one of the most unifying and exciting World Councils in the history of the YMCA movement. So we are very grateful for um, all of Denver's leadership um, in the global arena and really impressed by you know, your commitment to this work. Um, in addition to these efforts, we also have some um, philanthropic partnerships and grants. We're currently working, for example, with the American Express Foundation to advance meaningful work opportunities in Colombia and Spain. Um, we're working with the Peanuts Foundation on um, helping to advance camp inclusion in different countries around the world. So we have a lot of different activities that we're involved in um, as our US YMCA movement um, seeks to better advance Vision 2030 and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the last thing I'd say as a bridge to, to Trang and to Welcoming Week is the YMCA is an organization since its founding that has always helped migrants and internally displaced and refugees. We spread across the United States as a result of refugees. And you're gonna hear more about that uh, from Trang and migrants who came to our country. Um, but around the world today, immigrant inclusion is, is extremely important in the work that we do. And so welcoming week for us is really critical because it's a, it's a vital area of social justice and dignity uh, for the migrants that are living around the world. And it's a really critical way that the YMCA serves people, youth and families in so many countries around the world. Um, I just wanted to bring up three quick examples outside of our borders. And then um, Trang is going to talk about what we do here in the United States. Um, one is the country of Lebanon in the Middle East. Um, uh, Lebanon actually hosts more refugees per capita than any other country in the world. There's over 3 million refugees from Syria and Iraq, um, from uh, the West Bank and the occupied territories in Palestine. It's, it's one of the most um, difficult countries in, countries in the world because literally one out of every four people living in the country today are refugees. But they do incredible programs with the distribution of medical supplies, the organization of vocational training, helping young people get access to camp and to school um, and do an amazing job supporting um, refugees where it's very uncertain if and when they'll ever return to their, to their home countries. Um, in addition to that, uh, the YMCA is playing a lead role through YMCA Europe in the Ukraine humanitarian response. And as we speak, we are working with hundreds of thousands of internally displaced Ukrainian youth and families in Ukraine um, who were displaced by the war. Um, and then we are working again with hundreds of thousands who are outside the borders of Ukraine um, in countries like Romania and Slovakia and Poland and Spain and Germany, uh, where they are integrating Ukrainian refugees into the schools, into their camps, into their vocational training and job placement programs. Um, we're playing a lead role in the humanitarian crisis and uh, we've raised millions of dollars so far, and it's a crisis which is still unresolved. So we don't know what's going to happen next, um, but it's the YMCA continues to play a vital role um, in supporting the humanitarian needs. But in addition to that, um, when the war ends, we're going to stay. We're going to be there to rebuild the YMCA's, to rebuild the camps and youth centers and, and help build bridges of peace and cooperation in the region again. That's what we do best. And we have an incredible track record of that, um, as you can see through the spread of the YMCA movement around the world. And then lastly, I just wanted to lift up the incredible work at the Mexico border. Um, you know, thousands of young uh, children under the age of 18 are deported every year unaccompanied. And the YMCA of Mexico runs the Casas Migrantes, which are uh, the border homes for migrant youth, which welcome the, the young people once they come into the community, feed them, shelter them, uh, clothe them, take care of their psychosocial support needs, uh, and then eventually help them reunify with their families. Um, that's particularly important for those who are of Mexican origin, but we also have many that are from Central America or Haiti or Africa or Afghanistan or 
different places around the world. And the YMCA helps them until they can reunify with their families. So it's a, it's a great impact. It's a great legacy that's been um, active for over three decades uh, and a, a critical example of how the YMCA is making a difference in the lives of the most vulnerable. So that's the quick overview of the global YMCA movement. Again, thank you for Denver's support because you've been journeying with us for many years and all of this. And we'd love to talk with you more about opportunities to get engaged in, in new efforts as we look to the future. So with that, let me hand it over to my good friend, Trang, who's gonna talk a little bit more about all of our work here with newcomer immigrants in the US. For sure, thank you so much, Tom. So thank you again all for um, being here today. I do see some familiar names in the participant box. So a shout out to Joe, Debbie, Sue. I see y'all see y'all in the, the 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 chat box. So just now I see y'all. Um, I just want to first off uh, start off by saying how this work is so um, near and dear to my heart. My parents are actually refugees from Southeast Asia and came to this country in the early '80s, and I literally witnessed first. Um, first counts of how my parents struggled coming into this country and but by the good faith of other organizations and agencies they were able to be resettled and build a new a new home and new life in this country so I'm forever grateful for the resettlement agencies that really um, helped to um, support my my parents um, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for efforts like the um, refugee resettlement agencies that supported my parents. So as we think about our work within the Y, like Tom alluded to, uh, work with immigrants is not new to the Y. And I hope that everyone knows essentially the origin story of the Y, right? You know, George Williams, 18 year old was like, there is a need because there are this influx of um, young men coming from the English countryside into the industrialized London. He saw a need and responded. And essentially throughout the turn of the 19th century, the YMCA played an active role in supporting these men that needed a, a place to belong, a place to just be able to connect with others. And as the first YMCA to the United States, the Boston YMCA welcomed arriving Europeans. So something that um, I wanna just point out, and I'm gonna put a plug in, if you are not familiar with the YMCA archive, these are actually um, snapshots of the um, artifacts essentially that the YMCA archives at the University of Minnesota holds of the history of the YMCA. Um, when I had a chance to visit the archives, I was actually touching these different place cards that were passed out on these steam liners that were coming from Europe to the United States and essentially saying, do you need, um, you know, do you need to learn English? Do you need a place to shower? Do you want to make new friends? And it was just so surreal to be touching history, right, in the, um, the late 1800s. And it was just incredible to see that the impact of them. Um, other things that you may or may not already know, like the Y had a presence on Ellis and Angel Island, um, offering new immigrants information on the YMCA from housing to employment to language education. Um, and again, this is something that you'll want to add to your uh, YMCA trivia. The YMCA was the first organization to offer English as second language classes in Cincinnati, Ohio, to German immigrants. Um, decades later, during the Vietnam War, like I mentioned earlier, um, my parents were part of that wave that came to the United States of the arrival of Southeast Asian refugees. So the Houston YMCA played a critical role, and that's how the YMCA International Services was, um, the, was formed because of the influx of Southeast Asian refugees coming into that area. Um, but as you know, in terms of our timeline and history, between the 1980s and early 2000s, work with new immigrants among the U.S. kind of dropped sharply. Um, and, you know, certainly YMCA's had a lot of newcomer immigrant communities taking part in after school programming camps, youth sports and aquatics programs. But the focus, so customized work on new Americans was, again, a little, went into a little lull. But until um, recently, uh, in 2016, we were able to Oh, sorry, this is not it. Um, to really um, what we collectively pull together what we call the New American Welcome Center uh, model and effort. So uh, in 2016, we launched the New American Welcome Center project as a transformational model that YMCs could adopt. So it provided a framework for YMCs to organize their programs and services for newcomer immigrants to, to provide those wraparound services. 
and really look at creating a hub, whether that's virtually or in person, to support um, our newest neighbors to navigate the different systems within the United States. And in 2019, Denver actually joined the pilot cohort to be part of the New America Welcome Center efforts. And um, recently, Yolanda and her team and I have been connecting as we think through how does the New America Welcome Center work look like now? As we recover from the pandemic, a lot of shifts have happened, a lot of transition and changes. So what I, I've been seeing in the movement across the different New American Welcome Center sites, we have 18 YMC associations part of this, is really looking at how do we be, um, how do we look at our resources? How do, can we be uh, more effective how we serve our communities and partnerships and just ensuring that we're not duplicating efforts? So um, we're seeing a lot of why taking the time to pause and to reflect and look ahead in terms of how can this work be um, re, um, re-energized in terms of the current context of community. So, oh, sorry. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So here's a snapshot of a few photos of the New American Welcome Center work. This is obviously pre-pandemic, but it's been just a tremendous um, experience being part of this effort. Um, we want to give uh, recognition to YMCA of Greater New York. They were the first YMCA that really took the time to understand what is the needs in the immigrant community and created a model that we were able to adopt through this cohort of YMCA as part of this initiative to be able to scale something that is um, easily adoptable, but also at the same time, giving the intentionality of how we serve our immigrant community. So uh, as we think about our broader um, commitment to our work, but it, this is part of us as an organization, right? When we think about a mission for all, um, again, I think this is not new news for folks, but I just wanted to take the moment to recognize when we think about our mission as an organization, the why is made up of people from all backgrounds working together to strengthen community. Together, we work to ensure that everyone just has the opportunity to reach their full potential with dignity. We share the core values of caring, honesty, respect, responsibility that guide everything that we do. So when I think about the work in supporting our immigrant refugee communities, but also our general um, equity work, our diversity and inclusion global work, we need to ground ourselves in ensuring that we are serving for all. And how do we, how does that look like? How does that show up in our, um, you know, our youth development programs, in our aquatic, in our membership, in our community outreach, and just ensuring that we're reaching um, all those that um, want to be part of the YMCA. So when I think about the equity journey and, and where we are. Um, granted, as I shared some of those tidbits of history with you all, um, this is still a, a work in progress for us at YUSA. You know, it was, I would, I want to say, Tom, please chime in. In the early 2000s is when YUSA really took the intentional time and effort to really reflect on our own equity journey. What does that mean to be for all? And that's where the, the birth of New Dig and Global DEI in terms of understanding how do we um, analyze our processes, but also really look at some of the things that have done harm to community and how do we unlearn that? How do we ensure that we are moving forward and reflecting on, on that as well too, as we think about power, privilege, access, inclusion, you know, being an anti-racist multicultural organization, what does that look like as we think through the different dimensions of diversity of how we serve our communities as well? So when you think about Welcoming Week and where this work sits, you know, each of us all have a role in advancing equity for all. And um, it, it takes staff at all levels, representing our business functions, working in, in cooperation, and really looking at the internal capacity of our building efforts to strengthen the why and in the community as well, too. So here you'll see community bridge building is a way that we um, really look at this work in terms of our equity work, but also Welcoming Week, right? Welcoming Week is a community bridge building effort to really bring communities together, long-standing, you know, receiving communities with our newest neighbors into our community. So how do we look at bridging across differences and um, really working across divides and just ensuring that we have um, a voice of unity, but also just being able to lift um, the uniquenesses that each community group holds. So with that said, I want to leave the group with this quote. Together, we can create a more welcoming nation where everyone can belong. So um, I hope that what Tom and I shared today resonated with you all. But um, that is essentially our very high level cliff notes, like teaser version of what is typically a, you know, a session that we normally do with like 
long periods of time, but I know this is something that we wanted to quickly um, just highlight and we can maybe open it up for conversation or questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much uh, to you, Tom and, and Trang for, for giving us that overview, right? Um, and so just to sort of reset on, on uh, you know, who's on the call today. So uh, I realized I didn't even introduce myself. <laughs> um, so I'm Minister Yolanda Richard. Um, I'm currently the Vice President of Community Impact at the Denver Metro Y, uh, leading on uh, DEI implementation and our uh, impact work and narrative. Um, and, and yes, as Tom and Train uh, mentioned, we, we organized this conversation to really you know, open uh, up our staff and open up our community uh, really to the history of the YMCA, right? We're a, a very local um, organization in a lot of ways, but we do have a global reach. And so the hope here is that uh, the teaser, right, is really um, a, a, a huge eye opener, right? And, and, and how we're, we're connected to folks all around the world. Um, and so I wanna invite uh, those who are on the call uh, to submit questions in the chat, right? We have access to, to Tom and Trang here for at least another 30 minutes, we, we, we have them. Uh, so if there are questions that you have for them about their role, about uh, their careers, how they got to where they are, um, about the, the Denver Y, uh, Y Global, anything, you can drop that in the chat. Um, and as we're waiting for folks to, to drop their questions in the chat, um, we'll, we'll just kick off with a couple of, of questions that we've pre-prepared here. Um, so as I mentioned before, we many YMCAs around, around the country are very local. Um, and a lot of our work happens in wellness centers with fitness, uh, youth development, camp. Um, and a lot of folks on this call, right, find themselves in those wellness centers, right, behind a desk, uh, managing equipment, uh, help us to, to to sort of connect those folks that are in our wellness centers on the ground in community to what's happening on on the global level. How 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 can we sort of connect with what you all are doing um, at YUSA? Thanks. I'll, I'm trying. If you want, I'll jump in, and I um, want to have you also share some of your thoughts and ideas. Um, first of all, within our um, uh, leadership development, so our learning and leadership development system, we actually have a one of the certifications that that uh, staff and YMCA's can pursue is a global leader certification. So we do have a wide variety of um, training courses that are available um, around our global work, um, also linked to all the work that we do in DEI uh, as well. So everything from implicit bias, cultural lenses, understanding the global YMCA movement. Um, there's a range of opportunities that are available um, that um, staff, um, even if you're just getting started in the YMCA in your career, you can start to learn more and connect um, through that. And that's a great mechanism. It's very easy. It's very cost-effective um, to begin. Um, in addition to that, um, we have some more advanced level um, cohorts that many of our young leaders are a part of. Um, so those include the Emerging Global Leaders Initiative, which is a, a it's usually about a eight month cohort. And uh, right now we have 25 um, young leaders under the age of 35 um, from around the United States. They go through a lot of our foundational diversity, equity and inclusion training courses and global training courses. But they also have an opportunity to come together as a cohort. This year, they spent time in Chicago, which was really cool. And um, and then later in the year, they will all be part of um, the America's Youth Summit, which is a summit that's being organized between Canada, the United States, and Latin America and the Caribbean. It will take place in Bogota, which is one of our incredible YMCAs um, uh, around the world. And they'll be there with a uh, 100 other young leaders from from our three regions in the Americas, um, talking about Vision 2030 and social justice issues, uh, where YMCA's are leading global change. Um, and then in addition to that, there's all the things that you can do that connects to the global movement um, through Welcoming Week. I mean, Welcoming Week's one of the most important events, and that's really important. The, the whole world 
in uh, is watching our welcoming week because as we welcome newcomers and embrace that, that also influences many other parts of the world, especially those countries that have where we have a lot of immigrants. And so it means a lot to them to see our commitment and solidarity. In addition to that, there's a whole range of world YMCA virtual and in-person youth initiatives that you can connect to at uh, it's um, www.ymca.int, which is the World YMCA website. Um, but there's, for example, the youth-led solutions initiatives where young people are leading um, climate change action um, in, in their communities um, uh, through a, an initiative that the World Y and Y USA partner on together. So there's a a range of ac activities. If you look at Link or you connect with any of us, uh, we can try to help steer you into some of those specific opportunities. Would, what else would you add, Trang? Yeah, I would um, just underscore what Tom mentioned around. Um, all the things that he mentioned are all on YMCA Link. And if you are not already on Link, um, please maybe make, I know it's sometimes hard to get on Link, but once a week, 10 minutes, just log on, see what's going on in the YMCA world. Or if you're an avid social media user, um, you know, you can follow us, myself, Tom, on LinkedIn. We usually post a lot of things on LinkedIn, um, as well as um, Facebook as well, too. Even our, we have a global YMCA Instagram handle. For those that use Instagram, we tend to post or repost other content from um, our global partners. So if you want to get connected, I would say for sure, first things first is YMCA Link. Um, what is it called? Uh, join the Diversity Inclusion Global Community on YMCA Link and then um, follow us on LinkedIn. You can add us, we can connect with you and you can sort of see th um, the updates and things that are happening. Um, but yeah, I think if you, there are intentions to want to connect and learn, it, the floodgates will open. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I can testify to that. As soon as I added uh, uh, the dig function to, to my link account, the whole world opened up and I was like, oh, all this has been developed and created. So this is fantastic. Um, so, the, so there's actually a question in the chat from, uh, from Debbie. Debbie um, and we'll go ahead and answer this live. But uh, Debbie brings up a really good question about uh, supporting world service um, as a volunteer. Right. So she says, when looking at the needs of world service, how do you prioritize the need? Um, and that she continues to support Nicaragua um, as one of Denver's partners. So can you speak to, you know, if you're not a staff person, you're not on, on payroll at the Y, um, how can you plug in if you're if you're a volunteer? Yeah, well, um, a couple of things. I mean, the, the support for world service is huge. And, um, you know, all the countries that uh, receive support from world service, and it's it's um, usually over 30 to 40 every year, um, have great need. I mean, the need exceeds what we're able to raise. Um, so they continue to make a difference. I mean, we, we, we do sometimes organize special campaigns when there's a particularly huge humanitarian challenge, and you know we've done that in the past with um, with Haiti, with Ukraine, with in Ethiopia. Sometimes, sometimes things are so big that we really need a special appeal. Um, yeah, the, you know the tsunami that took place uh, years ago. We've had some really big uh, special appeals, but um, you know it could be um, through support to your Y to Y partner. Uh, you know, Denver has the, its wonderful history with Nicaragua. Uh, but it could also be to the overall campaign that goes to the other countries that we allocate or to another specific partner that has great need. Um, so there's lots of ways that you can contribute. When it comes to international wide wide partnerships and exchanges, we're strong believers that they're, they're, they're the most effective when you have a good balance of volunteers and staff leading the work together. Um, and in the strongest enduring partnerships that we have, and some of them are more than three or four decades old, um, uh, it's really the volunteers and the board members that kept things going over time, um, which is, it's you know, we've got some wonderful examples of that. So volunteer engagement at all levels um, is super important, um, both from a strategy perspective, as well as getting things done. Um, and uh, it's really important that we, as much as possible, try to engage our broad network of volunteers in our global work when when possible. Um, you have some wonderful volunteers with Joe and Debbie and others in Denver yeah. that are well known by all of us. 
but it, the, all of that work really makes a difference. Fantastic. So we have a, a question from Amanda, uh, Scott's pre uh, press singer. Um, what do you perceive as the greatest challenge in this work currently in a post-COVID environment? Do you perceive the challenges globally as different from the challenges wise may be experiencing locally? It's a good question. Mm, interesting. Um, it's a big question. I, I'm going to try to answer it um, based on what I've learned from young leaders. And that is when we did surveys of young leaders at YMCA 175, which was the 175th anniversary event that took place in London, England, we had over uh, 4,000 young leaders from uh, almost 100 countries in London, um, as well as uh, World Economic Forum surveys. The number one thing on the minds of young people today is the greatest existential threat is climate change. And we see all around the world, um, climate injustice disproportionately impacts communities of color, communities of poverty in our country and around the world. Um, it's a hard reality. We've got YMCA's in many parts of the world that are immediately impacted by climate change and in their operating environments and their agriculture and their economy. Um, and so, um, you know, young people really want to um, make a difference in this area. And so um, later this year, we actually have a, a group of U.S. YMCA leaders who learned from the World Council in Denmark uh, about what other countries are doing. And we want to look at how do we reduce our own carbon footprint? How do we help get more young people uh, into the outdoors? Equity in the outdoors is a huge topic. Um, what could we do to use our influence to advocate for better policies and practices? Um, so, you know, I think that's something that's just, we're still trying, we have so much potential. We have the, this enormous grassroots game in the United States and around the world that we can activate, but we still could be a bigger force for good. And young people, frankly, are challenging us to say, hey, step up. Where are you? Um, the YMCA needs to lead more. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so we have another question here from um, from Joe. Um, Tom and Train, have you noticed any changes in how uh, the Ys participate, how the U.S. Ys participate in the international movement since COVID? <laughs> Another good question. Um, you know, I want to two things I want to say is it's amazing how much our YMCA's stayed engaged even during COVID, and how much solidarity and support they continue to provide even though they were facing enormous challenges themselves. And I we want to recognize and thank all of the local Ys like Denver who did that. Um, for those who had um, deeper relationships and connections. Um, it didn't change that much at all. I think what's happening right now is, um, I don't know if it's COVID or it's just a new generation of new YMCA leaders coming in um, as times change. Um, I, I am seeing um, YMCA leaders with a stronger worldview that maybe it's because they are from an immigrant family or they've worked globally before, but they, um, I'm finding that we don't have to make the case for global as much anymore. They understand like, hey, this is who we are and something we should do, which is which is to me very encouraging. That's not true everywhere, but um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful um, with um, the generations of leaders of YMCA people that are coming in now that they're going to do even more. And, and I think they really have a strong worldview and that, that gives me optimism for the future. Train? Do you have a, a thought here as well? I think um, what I've seen is specifically with my work um, with the Philippines Coalition and with the National Asia Pacific Islander Leadership Employer Resource Group, um, we've seen a, an a increase in, in wanting to get more involved and connect with our partners in Asia um, as we think about sort of what the pandemic did around um, you know, the anti-Asian hate and all these sort of issues that are facing the Asian Pacific Islander communities. There's been, I think, uh, again, a tremendous increase in, in staff and volunteers wanting to be more involved to do more. And how do we continue to connect the dots with our work here locally, but also globally, recognizing that some of the, um, the similar issues are also happening with our global partners. Yeah. 
Um, well, I want to uh, continue to, to invite folks to drop questions in the chat, but uh, I, I think the questions that have been answered so far are really um, sort of illuminating, right? What I, what I hear coming back uh, is, is that we, we have sort of increased interest around the global work, right? And, and thinking about uh, the, the history of the why, uh, where the why is today, um, there's increased interest in, in, in the global work. But what I'm finding most interesting is Trang's presentation that talked about the why really beginning as an organization that supported folks from other countries, right? That really stepped in to provide ESL classes, uh, support, safe space, right? For those who were coming into uh, the US. And I, I'm just curious there about um, where within our, when, when did the YMCA sort of um, step back from its origins, right? Uh, where did that disconnect happen? Um, because I can tell you, and most of the folks on this call can tell you that the idea of the YMCA being a global movement is a new idea for many of us. And so can, can you guys speak to um, where, where, where did we, where do we make, where did we make that pivot historically and, and how do we get back uh, to our roots um, in, in being that global movement? I'm gonna kick it to you first, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thanks, Drang. Um, it, it, a lot of it happened um, when I first came to the Y around that time in the 80s and 90s, I think the Y was really pivoting so deeply to community health and wellness and, you know, a membership orientation when we used to be much more community outreach focused, um, that that became the bigger priority around in, in understanding and sustaining our operations. And, um, you know, one of my YMCA mentors had a great quote um, about governance um, uh, earlier this week that he shared with me. And that was that one of the challenges with our, our leadership and our boards at times is we, um, we focus on sustaining the organization and not the mission. And, um, you know, the real mission of the Y is, is a lot of outreach work and community development work and community partnerships. And so, but I've seen a big change in that over the years, that, which gives me a lot of hope. And even just you know, I remember when Welcoming Week first started, it was a, a handful of whys. Now it's, you know, it's half the country and we're in all the states and it's incredible. And I think we're getting more back into that grassroots, um, not just being a membership only focused organization, but an organization that helps convene and collaborate with others to advance community change. And with that, that's where I think we're kind of rediscovering our past. Um, what else would you add to that, Trang? Yeah, I can speak to the the second part of your question, Yolanda, of like, how do we get back to that? It's our young people. I think about, again, 18-year-old George Williams is like, oh, this is all happening around me. Let, me. let me do something. So I feel like we need to get out of the way of our young people, give them the voice, give them the space to really like lead that next sort of iteration of what the why will be for the next 175 years. I mean, we had that convening in London, England for the 175th um, anniversary. And, you know, I don't know how folks have heard that we established the first um, National Youth Advisory Council from the national office. So we have, I don't know how many, I forget how many, but we now have first the first ever National Youth Advisory Council that has a direct connection to our national board. So I, I think that's a huge win. And I think as we think about essentially reclaiming that history, um, it's our young people around the world and the United States. So I think that is what is promising and, and inspiring for me to help kind of like lead, not lead the way, but like make make the path and let me get out of the way. <laughs> I'm not young anymore. <laughs> no, but what, what you all are saying is it's just so inspiring, right? And, and you know, the, the YMCA, right? We're a youth development organization, right? We, we do camp and uh, we run programs, right? Surrounding, you know, youth, um, but, but I think sometimes it, we we struggle, right, to connect the dots between um, caring for youth and empowering youth uh, to be world changers, game changers. Um, 
systemic change warriors, right? And so I, I, I guess that that's the follow-up question to this, right? Um, if, if, if the why on a global level um, recognizes, hey, you know, we, we have, you know, maybe we can call this a bit of mission drift, <laughs> um, you know, and, and we've sort of stepped away from uh, seeing ourselves as a community um, based uh, organizer and organization. Um, and we know that youth is the, the solution to that, right? Pouring into youth is, is the solution to that. How do we transition from camp to campaigning? <laughs> How do we transition from um, holding a, a youth program uh, to empowering youth to see themselves as leaders? What would you recommend to the Denver Y and, and perhaps other YMCAs that might, might get a hold of, of this uh, recording? <laughs> What, what would you recommend to us? That's an awesome question. Um, you know, uh, first of all, I think um, to have some critical reflection internally around, are we an organization that provides services to young people or are we a platform that gives young people the opportunity to lead change? Um, because, um, you know, that's how we started and some of the best work that we do is because young people, I'm thinking about youth led solutions right now, you know, come up with incredible ideas and make a difference and make a change. And, um, so it becomes with some of that understanding of who we are. It's also critical as Trang mentioned, like with youth councils or youth voice and youth leadership, um, to make sure that in, in influential places and spaces, uh, young people are at the table, they can speak up, they can speak out, there's a voice. Um, and then the third thing is, and we learned this from World Council, and this is even a practice that we're going to utilize in the America's Youth Summit in, in Bogota this year in November, is intentional intergenerational dialogue. Um, and and it's not really an either or. We're not trying to, you know, eliminate um, senior leadership or older leadership's role because they have a critical role to play, but to build a deeper partnership that's more authentic, um, you know, which begins with senior leaders and older leaders like myself listening better uh, and more intentionally um, passing on leadership opportunities, but then also just how do you strategically plan things together to, to, to create that change? So I see hope for it. I do see a lot of progress. Um, and again, I'm encouraged by um, young people today because I feel like they're very confident, they're very clear about what they want to change, and it's it's really our role to give them that mandate to do it. What else would you add, Trang? Yeah, for me, what I um, went to as thinking about um, what you asked, Yolanda, is exposure. I think about when we, when we think about global learning and infusing sort of the education and the awareness at an early age, don't wait until folks are in high school or when they're done with school. I um, mean, we, we know that early learning in general is great for, for children to develop the skills, the skills that they need. But as we think about our commitment to equity and our global work, like our global leadership work, we can start as early as when they are in, you know, preschool or when and talk about our global movement and, and things, you know, what we, how we cook, food here is, you know, different from over here or different holidays or, you know, just how do we have that exposure to other cultures and learning about our YMCA movement. Um, hopefully folks in Denver, you, you receive that beautiful, you know, world service map that talks about the different countries and different stories. And, you know, you scan the QR code and you hear those stories. Like how, how amazing would that be if we were able to infuse that early on throughout all of our programs from camp to aquatics to understand sort of like the counterpart in the different countries that we are in the YMCA. So I think to your point, Yolanda, is really having folks understand the full scope of our mission and the impact that we have. And we are such a tremendously unique organization that has so much history, right? 179 now, 108, I lose count. But, um, you know, it's a very long, you know, very old institution, but I think we've been so great at continuing to evolve and, and, and really make way for the next, um, iter you know, generation to, to really lead. Yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, to you both for, for responding to that question. 
I'm going to ask an even harder question, uh, and then and then I'm going to uh, pivot back to the to the chat and see uh, the comments that have been coming through and just uh, speak them out loud. Um, but to those of us that um, are wondering, well, I I, I want to be committed to this work in um, a different way. Um, but how do we make revenue? <laughs> how do we sustain this organization um, simply by doing good around the world and in community? Help us to connect the dots um, between, right, this coming back to our foundation um, and the responsibility of an organization to sort of stay upright. And, um, and I, I think a really good way to maybe enter into to answering this is, are there are there other organizations, other YMCA's that you can think of that are doing this work really, really well uh, that that we at the Denver Y can can be learning from? That's a great question, and you know, and we're not asking folks to abandon their membership or their good operational activities and their fees for service. I mean, we know there's a role for that and it's important. Um, but I do think the more that we become community outreach, whether that's in our own community or with global community, um, it does bring in a lot of new philanthropic partners. Um, it may, you may connect to individuals in your YMCA that have global roots. We, we see already in the chat how many of you are globally connected. Um, the many companies and foundations, you know, we're, we're for the first time working with several foundations and companies that want to support stuff in the U S but want to partner with us because we also have a global impact and they want to make a difference in, you know, in Colombia or in Korea or in, um, a different part of the world. So, I mean, there's opportunities with that. It brings in new resources and new thinking and elevates the visibility of the why as a key partner that's globally connected. There are some many YMCA's like San Francisco and Long Beach, and I know um, those are you know um, bigger communities in some places, but that are doing this really well, um, YMCA of the North, um, and that have a, a broad base of partners and individuals in the YMCA that are involved, and it really makes an impact. Anything you'd add, Trang? Yeah, I think I, I can share an anecdote from one of the New America Welcome Centers. I think it was Lawrence Greater Charlotte when they were scaling it to other parts of their um, community in more of a rural area. And the the executive director there was able to really foster a partnership with a local textile company because that local textile company had a lot of immigrant uh, employees who needed um, support services for their spouse and family. So a new partnership was birthed in terms of how can the Y step into support with some of those um, enrichment activities for the family or provide English classes. And so I think if the the commitment and the intentional effort behind supporting community is strong and you build that trust within the community in itself. I think to Tom's point, the resources and these different philanthrop philanthropic opportunities will emerge. So how do we tell our story in a way that is compelling, but at the same time, we are ensuring that we're walking our walk, right? When we're safe, we're, we're for community and that if there are parts of our work that may have done harm in the past, how are we on that road to un to re rectifying that and sort of going through the healing to ensure that we can build that trust again with community? Absolutely. Well, uh, we just have about three minutes left in our conversation. Um, and so I, I wanna use that time just to say thank you. Uh, thank you to you both <laughs> for spending time with the Denver Metro Y. Uh, for the ways that you've committed to this work, committed your life to this work. Uh, and we just uh, want to say thank you for that and, and, and to offer a blessing to you um, that you might continue uh, in strength and in wisdom um, and that uh, the work that you do at the Y uh, will expand well beyond anything that we're doing here today. And so thank you, thank you, thank you, both Tom and Trang for being with us today. Thank you all for your leadership and thank you for what you do. And uh, we look forward to doing more together. Yes, yes. Um, just a quick announcement. Um, so please, uh, we are hosting a human flow screening, um, the documentary Human Flow. 
um, tomorrow, September 8th at 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Um, and so if you haven't already RSVP'd or registered for that, please do go over to the Denver Metro Y um, uh, webpage, type in Welcoming Week, and you'll find all of the information there uh, to register for that screening tomorrow at 10 a.m. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your participation in this call. Uh, and please continue to join us for the remainder of Welcoming Week. Take care.